Hey, White Sox fans, it is Brett Valentini here hosting once again the South Side Sox Mothership Podcast. I'm going to get the number right this time. It's number 54, and we've got quite a crew here. And believe it or not, it's almost entirely different from just one night ago. It's our trade deadline podcast actually talking about trades with the White Sox. And let's go through a real quick introduction for everyone who's here it is super bill mikey who you may know he is the uh he's played such roles as guy who recaps wednesday games in april in may in june and i think he's back with us now he's taking a little bit of a break i think he's back with us uh welcome I'm back bill all right welcome west coaster uh let's see james fox insider he today told me that I'm an idiot for overvaluing Connor Pilkington. He didn't use those words, but that's okay. I can read between the lines, but thank you for setting me straight, uh, James. And I'm sure we will get a little more insight on what the White Sox gave up for Cesar Hernandez soon, but thank you for joining James. Uh, let's see, Super Joseph Reeses, Sox man champ. What else do I need to say? Indianapolis field office is represented. Uh, Zach Hayes, welcome. Terrific piece we just put up on site, sort of explaining a little bit of what Cesar, uh, Cesar Hernandez is going to bring to the White Sox. And I got to say, after reading it, I'm a little bit more excited about the acquisition, which means you did a good job, uh, I'd say. And uh, yeah, there's Darren Black. He's with me on all of these. He doesn't need an introduction. It's Darren. He's around. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, let's talk first about the first trade. Let's just go in <laughs> chronological order. Cesar Hernandez uh, it seems to be a quick flip. Or perhaps the White Sox even just said, okay, forget Eduardo Escobar. We don't even like the price at all. This guy we like better, uh, or the price is a little lower. Uh, let's strike. And I have to say, at first, I was a little ho-hum about it. And the more I learned throughout the day, and certainly in reading Zach's piece, uh, now I'm a little excited about this, uh, this piece added for second base for the remainder of the season. Yeah, I mean, he... I think everyone probably would have preferred somebody else, but uh, of the options available and knowing the Sox probably weren't going to go get Trevor Story or anybody kind of at that echelon. Um, and especially just for Connor Pilkington, who, I mean, improved compared to 2019. Um, but he's, I mean, he's better one than what they have already. Uh, switch hitter, you don't really need to pl platoon him that much. And he's showing good power this year. So thumbs up. And James, among a long list of guys that are going to be, say, Rule 5 eligible next year, you know, you cited Connor as a guy who, who could be in that sort of uh, jeopardy and the White Sox were unlikely to put him on the 40 man. Uh, he's a guy, it's no guarantee that somebody's going to take him next year and, and keep him on the, on the Major League roster all year, but he's maybe the closest in that group to someone who plausibly could have been. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, Darren might have talked about this earlier, like, like it looked like Connor Pilkington was a bad pick for a while. Like I liked that pick when they made it. Um, and then his stuff really backed up and he wasn't very good. And then this year he's actually pretty good again. Um, he was throwing mid nineties. I talked to some Indians, got some Indians writers today that were, you know, pretty underwhelmed. And I'm like, you know, it's actually not that bad. I mean, he's obviously older because he was a college starter, but yeah, the rule five thing's a big deal. I mean, the White Sox have all these guys, and I'm surprised that your Mike Rodolfo is still here and guys like that. Cause like some of these guys are going to lose for nothing. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, we saw it with Luis Alexander Basabe last year. Um, you know, I think some people were mildly upset, like Bernardo Flores gets DFA. I mean, yeah. like it happens, you can't keep everybody. So yeah, I don't think Pilkington was ever going to pitch in the White Sox rotation. You could argue that like, maybe you save him and trade him for something else. Like, okay, maybe, but this is, you know, it's fine. I think they got two upgrades today and they didn't give up anything that really like matters that much in the grand yeah. scheme of things. Yeah. The Intel I, I got, because occasionally I get Intel. <laughs> the Intel I got also was a little bit of a, a Connor, maybe had a little bit of a motor issue. I think maybe he's got that sorted out because he's had, he's put it together pretty nicely this year, but, and, and that, that could go on and who knows, he's a guy who might haunt the White Sox, but come on. The, those are those are outliers and you can't really act that way. Zach, in writing the piece that you did that's up on, on post, we're going to link it in, in this uh, in this post as well tonight. Uh, what jumped out at you as something that was um, uh, maybe a little bit of sucker punch? You know, you look at the stat line and it doesn't overwhelm, but uh, in there is a player that's, I think, a lot more dangerous and productive uh, than we might think. 
Yeah, he's just somebody that does everything kind of well for the most part. You know, his batting average is down from his career averages this year, and that's he's usually somebody who puts the ball in play a lot uh, and, and gets a high batting average. But he sacrificed a little bit of his contact ability for power. He's already got a career high in home runs. Uh, he's he's adequate on defense. He runs really well. Um, he is not Danny Mendick, I think, is the, <laughs> the biggest takeaway, takeaway with the bat, at least. I think... Um, that kind of uniform across the board solidness, um, not really having any major flaws is something that is, you know, sometimes kind of hard to get around when your other options are a Trevor story or a hobby bias. And you look at some of the other pieces there that are moving around. Uh, but they, they just needed an upgrade here, bottom line. And he's somebody that's going to fill a hole. He brings some balance. He brings some balance to the lineup. He doesn't swing and miss that much. He can hit from both sides. Um, if you leave a ball up to him, he can yank it out. He can throw the ball and play for a single when you need him to. He is, and I, <laughs> you can take this in any number of different ways, but he seems like the kind of guy that Tony LaRusso would want to use. Um, and I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way, like I, like I might usually, but he's, uh, he's, he's kind of a, kind of a Swiss army knife with a bat to some extent. And that's something, some flexibility that, that, uh, that they could use for sure. And I think especially what makes us a good read and please everybody go read it. Uh, is uh, Babbitt can be something tricky. We can just say, oh, well, he's unlucky or he's lucky. And it's not always that simple, but the way you spell it out really points to him having some crazy luck this year that is not going to repeat because his numbers are close to career, but the Babbitt is, is, is ridiculous. So you would expect uh, some real improvement, uh, some measurable improvement perhaps at the end of this year. Yeah. And like Babbitt is something you, you take it with a grain of salt. It's not always going to go back one way or the other way, but when you have a guy who's running a Babbitt 80 points below his career average, and you look at his stack cast numbers and he's not hitting the ball really any differently than he was last year. If anything, he's actually um, hitting it better. He's squaring it up more. His barrels have jumped all the way up. This is someone who you, you look at those numbers and you say, okay, something, something is not quite adding up here. And there's, you know, it doesn't seem like that there's really a two thirty hitter underneath what's going on here. All right, I want to shift to Ryan to Perry here as well and, and let anybody, everybody um, jump in, if you will. I will not ask my cubby stint question, but uh, maybe the question is, is this enough? It seems like we've got a guy at who, who literally is almost literally replacing Evan Marshall as Evan is looking like he's out for uh, effectively the year um, as perhaps that bridge guy to Liam Hendricks, or at least one of them. Uh, is this enough? Do we need more? Are we happy about uh, getting to Perry in the fold? I think that they should keep trying, but I'm very happy with how this one turned out. And if they can get a similar kind of return for what they gave up to get Ryan to para, then I would happily make another trade. Um, like only having to give up Bailey Horn for this rental. Um, I, I was very surprised, um, especially with the Cubs, um, you know, obviously with the way that the Jimenez and Cease trade has panned out up to this point, we have kind of discussed this like briefly on previous podcasts that you know, the kind of the expectation that the Cubs were going to ask for an extra high price for the White Sox in any sort of uh, deadline deals this year. Um, but yeah, I was very happy with um, the deal that they got in this case. Um, I like Bailey Horn, but I would absolutely make this trade 10 times out of 10. And, um, and hopefully that there, there are sim there's a similar, opportunity out there before the trade deadline um, on Friday. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing. I still want another uh, another guy. They've been tied to Richard Rodriguez and Paul Fry, who are both upgrades over, you know, like Reynaldo Lopez, Ruiz, Burr. So if they're going to go keep going the, that route, um, I would prefer that. I know in the last podcast, we also brought up um, if they're, they're able to find a catcher somewhere, um, if, you know, people are worried about the knee injury to Grandall and if he can actually catch when he comes back, um, which I assume he'll be ready for the playoffs to do that. But if you're looking to add another guy, um, but yeah, I mean, Tapera's, I mean, he's been really, really good this season. Like if you just look at his stat cast page, it's all red, especially this season. That uh, little cutter that he's got going right now is doing really well. Um, so I want them to add another guy, probably a lefty bullpen arm would be great, but this is a good start. I'll admit if I looked closer at Tapera's numbers, 
I should probably do that. But if I looked closer at prior to our podcast last night, that might have been my vote. I voted uh, Ian Kennedy, but that might have been my vote for the guy I most wanted on the team because he it just seems like he's going to slip in and play a role and way not cause any sort of disruption. And again, provide that bridge that has been shaky. It hasn't it hasn't not existed, but it's yeah. been very unreliable. And when you've got just guys like randomly, I mean, it's like Ronaldo Lopez now. Hey, Ryan <laughs> Byrne now. I mean, you want to be able to say, OK. Uh, eighth inning is Ryan Tapera's or, you know, or, or whatever. It seems like, um, especially given the prices Joe mentioned, uh, this is like a no lose proposition. I was actually kind of surprised, uh, that they actually got to Para. Not that, not that they, for the price. Um, Go ahead. Uh, I was just, yeah. So, so just like to just, Go ahead. um, it was, it was nice. It was nice to, that they got him. I seeing him in spring training. I know it's spring training and it doesn't really, mean anything but he was just uh, when I saw him was not good at all um which is and then the year took place and he started I mean no, I know he's 0 and 2 obviously his record means nothing he's got a 2.9 something ERA I really think he adds a wonderful arm and I, I think this is kind of huge it's also not that Evan Marshall's uh a terrible pitcher because we've seen him do well but uh I think he definitely needs a little readjustment too yeah, James, I think you had made a reference uh, earlier, you know, when I expressed shock at the price and, you know, you, you, you had a reasonable uh, um, answer in that, hey, he's, you know, the Cubs probably want to try and get him back. Uh, White Sox might have something to say about that but, uh, now, but um, that might have contributed a little bit to the price, although I'm not really sure why the Cubs necessarily feel need to be that generous. I mean, they're definitely in full rebuild now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I heard that from somebody today that they kind of like did him a solid that other teams were interested. He wanted to stay in Chicago, so they did it. My guess is if they had something way better than Bailey Horn on the table, they would have just sent him elsewhere. Um, you know, I agree with with Joe. Like, you know, I did all the draft coverage last year. I did, you know, mostly at Future Sox, and I liked that pick. And Bailey Horn's like, you know, a solid pick where they took him and they paid him 150 K, but like, yeah, you absolutely trade him to like try to win a world series. Um, you know, I echo some of the thoughts they need to do something else. Um, like I'm good with this. I'm good with both trades. Like they did something like everybody can stop freaking out. Like it's good, but like, you know, like I, I would prefer one more like reliever, like Paul Fry was mentioned today. He's going to be super expensive, but I mean, even like rice Iglesias or, Daniel Hudson or just somebody else. Like, I, I think they need one more. I hope they add one more reliever. Um, they have more prospects to trade. None that we're really going to freak out about. I don't think we've seen some of the prices. So, you know, I, I think they can get something else done if they want to. And I think they should want to, because, you know, who's their, who's their eighth inning right-handed setup guy, Ryan Tapera, maybe, I think, you know, so you know, I feel like they need one more guy. Okay, guys, this wouldn't be a White Sox podcast if we were just happy. So let's take a break and talk a little bit to what James sort of led us into, and that is what still needs to be done. <clears throat> and we can grumble a little bit if we want, or we can just be happy. We can high five. It's cool too. But we'll be back in just a minute with podcast number 54. Hey, it was just a moment and we are back with Southside Sox Mothership Podcast number 54. Got a variety of guys. I'm not going to do like the Love Boat, you know, credits here and introduce everybody again, but great crew here talking White Sox trade line. And the great, the good news about this trade deadline now is that we have stuff to talk about. And it's actually so far been pretty good news. Let's shift. James sort of led us into that in terms of what we still need is not necessarily a complaint because if this is all it is, hey, better than worse for sure. Uh, but let's go around, let's everybody take a turn and let's talk about what the greatest need is. And if you also want to throw out maybe the name that would connect with that, let's say positional need, uh, go ahead and throw it out. And, uh, you know, anyone, anyone can start. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, so again, um, like kind of been talking about this the entire time, each of us, uh, I think we're all still not really super comfortable with the bullpen. Um, I know it still feels weird, still feels weird for me because I was really excited about the bullpen, you know, prior to the season, like looking at all these guys, all these guys that I was following in the minors for a long time. And then Matt Foster just isn't himself anymore. Um, along, along with Evan Marshall and Jace Fry never really turned into what we all wanted him to. Um, but I think another 
obviously we want another setup guy. Um, Paul Fry would be awesome. Uh, and, and of course, Richard Rodriguez. Uh, I have seen that Rodriguez's spin has fallen more compared to other uh, pitchers. Uh, but if I'm picking one, I'd love Fry because he actually has some late inning, even though it's Baltimore, he actually does have some late inning uh, experience. And so if we want someone to come in there, you need to get some guys out, especially a lefty in that situation, then I prefer, prefer Fry. Um, and then prospect price side, I would like to win a world series. I would like to win a world series. So you're, these are your guys, you and James, these are your guys and you don't care. So if you don't care, we should not care. James, what's your, what's your position and maybe what's your uh, top on your wish list? Else they add, like, I guess you could add in right field if you wanted to, but like, I don't know. I mean, obviously we're banking on health, right? So at full strength, I mean, you're going to have angle and either Goodwin or sheets or who, like, that's probably fine. I think like if they traded for somebody, like I'm not going to get mad. I just like, don't think it's necessary. Now I think big time reliever, if you're going to empty the system for something, I think that's what you do. I don't think Kimbrell's realistic. I don't think they have a guy to headline something like that, but I mean, there's other guys like Daniel Hudson was a closer for a world series team you know i mean how much could that cost theoretically you know and i think Dar- i don't know if darren agrees like the system's obviously not very good um so like there's nobody that you should be unwilling to trade there's no untouchables but that doesn't mean you should trade like everything for like a minimal upgrade that's like those are like some of the arguments i've gotten in like on, like there's a mindset that's like oh well if the prospects aren't good like trade any of them who cares but it's like no i mean you're not going to trade you know, Matthew Thompson to get Eduardo Escobar, you know, like, so, like there, there's, li- there are limits, but I mean, they should, they should have enough. I think, I think relief pitching is what I, I would go back to. So. And it, and it didn't even hit me. I, I even covered uh, both of those guys, but okay. We lost when an Eduardo Escobar walks out the door, a Daniel Hudson came in. They're practically on the same thing. I don't think they quite were in the same locker room. They basically were on the team in the same year. So Daniel Hudson could be our Eduardo Escobar. Uh, Zach, Zach Hayes, uh, give me, uh, give me the guy your uh, feeling needs to be most imperative uh, to still acquire for the uh, stretch run. Yeah, uh, like everyone else has said, it's really a relief pitcher and a relief pitcher and a relief pitcher. Um, There aren't any other super major holes that aren't being filled internally right now. Um, Like James said, yeah, Kimbrell would be ideal. Kimbrell is going to fetch a lot more than what uh, we should be probably willing willing to give up right now. Um, Yeah, you know, I would love Paul Fry too. We were talking about him in the Slack a little bit earlier. I'm almost a little bit skeptical that they're going to go out and get a lefty. The thing about Tapera that interested me in particular is that he's a guy with slightly reverse platoon splits, actually. His arsenal and the way he operates, he's a righty who's going to get lefties out. And I have to wonder if that's something that they had in mind, knowing that uh, Bummer and Crochet have been at best inconsistent this year uh you know you look at any bad team in the league i'm looking at the orioles roster right now not only do they have paul fry they got a guy like named uh you know cole sulcer in there who has a great change up in a 96 mile an hour fastball every you know every team that's trying to lose 100 110 games out there is going to have uh <laughs> has a few guys in the back end of their pen throwing 90 and i think there's throwing 95 and there's 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 enough of them out there that like as has been said repeatedly i think if they if they want to get one, they, they should, I don't know why they wouldn't want to. At this yeah. point. <laughs> and we've been there, Zach. Hey, we've had the hard throwers and, and been pursuing 110 losses. Didn't quite make it there, but uh, okay. Uh, Super Joseph, uh, who's your guy? What's your position? You're going to throw us a curveball or is it just, you're just going to punch the fry ticket. I'm going to remain in the reliever camp, um, but it's not going to be with fry. It, his name was mentioned earlier, but I, I like Rodriguez personally. Um, Yes, he's he's a righty and, you know, a left-handed reliever would be very useful. However, like his splits are pretty even against um, both um, um, handedness of hitters. Um, like he's rocking an opponent's OPS this year of just under 500 against righties and just over with against lefties. So not a big difference there. Um, and like, I don't know if this is on Han's mind at all, but Rodriguez does play for the Pirates, and I feel like if the Pirates identify a prospect they like, it's probably not a very good prospect. So they could get they could get a steal from for for Rodriguez. I feel 
more confident in their ability to police the, the Pirates than the Orioles. Super Joseph kneecapping the Pittsburgh Pirates. Did not expect that, but I like it. Okay, way out on the West Coast. I gave you a chance to maybe warm up another cup of coffee. It's about 9.30 in the morning out there. Uh, Bill Mikey, uh, who you got on your uh, wish list? Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in that reliever camp too and kind of uh, echo what Joe said there. I think Rodriguez is the best bet, especially with Han kind of saying that he wants to give starting pitching a few more breaks every once in a while. So that I figure that probably means that Kopech's going to come in as a starter every once in a while to kind of give the first five uh, a break. So I think Rodriguez is a, another good righty that comes in and, and kind of is able to set up. I also do want to touch on something that Darren said. Another concern is the catcher spot. Obviously there's not a lot of catchers that put the backup catcher spot. If we're stuck with Collins uh, for the time being, it might, it might hurt and we don't know where Grandall is going to be when he comes back, if he's going to be comfortable behind the plate. And uh, it makes me a little nervous to have Collins there full time. Yeah. You and 8 million other fans. Uh, okay. I, nobody asked me, but I'm going to just throw mine out. Mine is, uh, and I don't want to pick on Rickon because this is a Rickon praise day because he did really well and uh, paid, paid very little for, for a couple of real good pieces. I think for this stretch run, uh, the guy I think I'm acquiring is Dylan Cease. I think he's going to be the real we acquire and he's going to play a role. And let's face it in the back of their heads. I think they realize obviously the rotation will shrink and you're not probably going to throw Keiko out of the pen unless something really bad happens. Uh, so yes, that's tongue in cheek, but uh, at worst case, we will probably have an arm from the rotation. Uh, again, it could just be Kopech, but it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a five man rotation in the playoffs. So just still had to tease you, Rick. Uh, let's go around uh, the league. There's been a lot of crazy stuff going on. Anthony Rizzo apparently is going to get to hit, uh, 150 foot chip shots uh, into right field in Yankee Stadium. Uh, a lot of movement, including apparently Max Scherzer is going to the West Coast uh, somewhere. Uh, reactions, things seem to have picked up today. Pretty bold move by the Yankees, I thought, with Rizzo. Um, yeah, I guess they're really making a push for it. So, I mean, it's, yeah, the odds are not in, in their favor right now, um, but yeah, props to them for trying. It's a, it's going to be a good offense for the, the sixth place team in a five team playoff. So yeah, <laughs> feel really, I feel good really job, bad Yankees. for those long, long suffering New York Yankees fans. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah how, but, how about the, how about the fact that uh, the Padres seemingly were going to get like Max Scherzer and then what at the 11th hour, it seems like the Dodgers uh, have said, what, what is the status is something switched so, up? I think, I think Mike Rizzo went to the White Sox school of leaking to the media. Early. You know, it's like, tell him, tell him you're going to San Diego and the Dodgers. Yep. So then the, so then the Dodgers get Scherzer and Trey Turner, uh -huh. which is insane. Yeah. Well, Mike, Mike Rose, Mike Rizzo was a, a, an OG in that. We were just talking about on the podcast yesterday about how he sort of double dealt the White Sox with the whole, uh, Hey, let's go out and get, uh, Edwin Jackson, then whoops, no, we're not trading for him, even though that's the only reason you got him from Arizona. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, Scher uh, Scherzer uh, moving within the league. Uh, we have a white set. There's just been a lot of crazy uh, movement. Do we expect that there's still going to be something leading up even into Friday or is, is there pretty much no one left to move at this point? I I will say that ESPN did report that uh, they're not only getting the Dodgers are not only uh, trying to acquire Scherzer, but Trey Turner as well. Mm -hmm. So they're going after Trey as well, which kind of uh, to me is there that that puts them right at the Padres level. Well, so it's, you know, the headliners, Kiebert Ruiz, who's a catcher, he's like a mm -hmm. top 15 prospect in baseball. And most teams can't trade Kiebert Ruiz, but they have two catchers better than him on their big league team. So mm -hmm. yeah, like the Dodgers are just a yeah. machine, obviously. And Brad, I think, I think there's actually like a lot more moves um, mm -hmm. tomorrow. Like I think the Cubs have a few more in them. Yeah. I mean, Kimbrell's going to go, Bryant's going to go. Um, you know, I think the after Scherzer, I think others, the starting pitching market isn't great, but I think there's going to be others that go just, you know, because once he goes to the Dodgers, there's all these people that didn't acquire pitching right. that now will have to. So, and, and the most underrated part of all this is the Cubs now, I think, have finally reached 85% vaccination rate. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've made a couple jokes about Ryan Tapera actually getting to a clubhouse. He can feel a little bit comfortable shaking all the hands in. So, way to go, Ryan. Uh, yeah, Jose Barrios is a guy. It seems like he's, uh, you know, uh, getting shopped and maybe out the door because, uh, you know, they tried to extend him and somebody said no or whatever. So, 
Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how many more uh, headline guys San Diego uh, acquires because apparently they're the only ones who are you know allowed to at least be primaries. He, he, although Mike Rizzo gotta love him, he's he's just not above using teams to just dick them over and then go somewhere else. Uh, what else is out there that we are are are, are looking for? Do we have an idea where maybe Kimbrel or Bryant goes, or do we care? Been seeing that the uh, there's a lot of talks about the Giants making a big move. Um, have not quite gone for it yet. They've been connected to Bryant too. Um, I think around this time tomorrow, we're probably going to be pretty unhappy with um, whatever package the twins are getting for uh, Jose Barrios, because um, I can't, I have to imagine he's going to be the most sought after pitcher on the market with Scherzer with Scherzer gone. So uh, that's kind of what I'm looking at next, at least. Yeah. Looking to see what the Padres give for Jose Barrios, basically. That's what, that's what we're waiting for. But I've seen, like, Chris Bryant to the Mets. I think that would be hilarious. Uh, I just, like, the NL East is just so weird. And, like, the Mets, like, everybody's injured on that team. And they just keep adding and adding and adding and adding. Um, Even from the offseason with Lindor, who struggled for a while. It's just, I I can't really remember a deadline this active, uh, especially uh, this, like, long before the deadline even happened. Uh, I don't know, like, what's different about this year. I don't know if, like, the CBA is playing into anything and if teams just really want to get out in front and just go all in this season and then just say, like, hey, we don't know. Uh, but, yeah, this has been – I mean, it's been really fun, even though the Sox aren't, like, really in in those talks for those guys. Um, it's still been, like, a fantastic trade deadline. I think it's interesting not to diss the guys that the White Sox have sent out, but – uh, and I've made several jokes about Rick Hahn turning this from like a, uh, uh, a seller's market to a buyer's market with what he's pulling here. I mean, is there, is there a chance knowing that there's just not much down there in the seller, but is there a chance that he's able to put something together that's more substantial than we think? I know the pieces come, I mean, the, the Tinker Toys are only going to fit together in a certain way. And it's just probably going to be a mess, but is there something out there to like make some sort of strange, like a Hail Mary for a, for Chris Bryant or even a, a Kimbrough, I think we can all just say no, but do the White Sox have that in them, whether courage-wise or even just capital-wise? Well, I don't think they have it capital-wise. Uh, I don't think they can necessarily compete uh, with, I mean, just, I know Scherzer and Trey Turner is a whole different trade offer, um, but just, I mean, even going to like Starling Marte yeah. uh, for Jesus Lazardo, I don't know if the Sox could have necessarily competed with that, even though Lazardo has kind of lost some of that prospect luster that he had a couple of years ago. Still young, controllable, good, good pitcher. Um, just, I mean, it, it would be great. I mean, Chris Bryant would obviously start wherever you needed him to, because he's been doing that for the Cubs. I want, I would be curious where he would go, um, especially with other people coming back. Uh, Kimbrell would be the perfect guy. Um, I think, I don't know who would actually close. I'm guessing it would still be Hendricks, but I don't, I don't know because Kimbrough's been so good this year, uh, but he's also, uh, you can have him for next year as well. So I just kind of think since he's not a rental, uh, he's not really an option for the Sox with the capital they have. Uh, like we're here saying like Bailey Horn's gone, Connor Pilkington gone. And like us as Sox prospect people, we can see that there's something going on and they're fine. Um, but they're still like, like the, those are the type of guys they're, they've traded right now. So uh, I don't expect it. It'd be awesome, but um, I'm just looking for like Richard Rodriguez, Paul Fry, some lower tier guys that they can actually get with the prospects they have and are willing to deal. And we might not even be willing, we might not even be able to afford Richard Rodriguez. I mean, let's face it. Um, but I would, I'm now I'm curious, you know, I mean, I've been, uh, you know, I guess I won't say a hot doubter, but I mean, you know, you do want to see some action and we haven't seen him perform under deadline pressure because they've never been in it last year, sort of hard, you know, doesn't even really count. And they certainly punted last year um, and pr- maybe wisely. Uh, but I would say that early on, at least uh, given the circumstances, he's, he's coming through. I'm curious to see what, what more there might be. Uh, uh, any insights as to where it is? Yeah. Well, so I think the difference this year is like they they're fully able and willing to take on money, which I think is a positive. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but the negative is that they don't have prospects. So like, it might, like it might not really, you know, and there's not like Kimbrell is a, is a weird fit because of the, you know, the contract, like I think the contract is a bargain mm-hmm. for next year, but like, I just don't know if they're going to commit $30 million to their eighth and ninth inning guys. Okay. And like, I think the Cubs are going to get like a top 100 guy for Kimbrel. Like, I think they're going to get somebody in the 70 to 100 range. And then another guy that's probably like a system top 10. Um, and I just like, don't think the White Sox have that unless they like love Jake Berger and think he's their third baseman, for, you know, or something like who knows, like something like that could, cause look, I mean, I'll tell you, I, I didn't think that they would swing what they did today for Connor Pilkington and, and Bailey Horn. Right. Mm-hmm. So like maybe their prospects have a little more value than we think. And the guys that we'd be willing to give up in something. Right. I mean, I, I don't know what you're getting with one of Gavin Sheets or Jake Berger, one of the high school arms that everybody knows. And like, you know, one of their good lottery tickets, like Jose Rodriguez, Brian Ramos. Right. So like mm-hmm. Sheets, Jared Kelly, Ramos, what does that get you? I, I don't know. I don't I don't really know what that gets you. So, and those are probably like their best trade chips. What if we were to just throw in the name Elijah Tatis? <laughs> yeah, just throw in the name. Yeah. <laughs> He's gotten hot. <laughs> He's gotten hot. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah right. Fifteen at bats. Right now, um, that count for hot? There's a there's an intern uh, frantically uh, FedExing uh, Mike Rodolfo highlights to the north side, just frantically, just packing them, just wave <laughs> after wave, please. Um, well, I guess uh, that might wrap it up. We're going to do this again tomorrow if there's more action to be had. We might just do it anyway, even if the White Sox don't do much. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to put this up. Uh, we're going to keep. We're going to try to keep things just rolling here with the uh, trade deadline podcast. So, thanks, James and Darren and Zach, Bill on the West Coast and Super Joseph Reese's Manning the Indianapolis field office. Uh, thanks for joining me, guys, uh, and thanks as always, everybody, for uh, listening, reading, sometimes even watching us uh check out zach hayes's cool piece on uh, cesar uh, hernandez a uh, really nice might get you actually a little excited about our new uh starting second baseman i think uh and um, hey maybe there's gonna be some more fun stuff to talk about tomorrow around baseball there certainly will be uh in white Sox world maybe there even will be as well but uh thanks guys uh for for joining thanks everybody for listening and we'll probably be back at you tomorrow <laughs>